Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Smoke Girl Podcast. My name is Alexis Armstrong, your host. Nice to meet you. The Smoke Girl Podcast is a place to celebrate and highlight women, trans women, and non-binary folk working within STEM and trade occupations. So please tune in, take a break, and join us. We are on Smoke Girl. And today we are extremely lucky to be joined by Mila Zautner, who is a third-year geological engineering student at the University of Saskatchewan. She's going to talk a little bit about her experience as a woman in engineering, her experience within university. She's also an executive of JESS, which is the Geological Engineering Student Society. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that organization, its initiatives, what it does, the role of community and organizations within university and science in general. And then she also has some pretty cool work experience that we're going to talk about. And I think she's been able to go underground, which is something very different. Not many people get to do that. So I can't wait to have this conversation. Mila, thank you so much for coming on the show. It is so nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. I'm really happy to be here. Oh, it's honestly, it's an honor to meet you. It's so nice to have you on the show. And when I was researching you, there were so many different cool things that kept on coming up and there were so many things that I want to mm-hmm. talk about. And I thought maybe we could start at the very beginning before we get to Mm -hmm. all the nitty gritty. You're studying right now at USASC Geological Engineering. Could you kind of walk through how you discovered engineering and then the interest behind choosing this field and choosing geoeng? Because I think that's also a specialty within a specialty um, and walk through that, that journey. Yeah, totally. I guess I can't really recall a distinct moment where I decided engineering was a potential like career path or anything it probably would have been those like pamphlets you get in high school career days but like a huge like overwhelming (laughs) list of jobs and everything and engineering obviously would have been one of them and I actually had a teacher in high school he was probably one of my favorites he was also my wrestling coach throughout high school and he yeah he used to be an engineer so I met with him after class one day and kind of talked to him about it I really didn't know anything about engineering, like what schooling was like. So he kind of told me about his experiences and he was pretty encouraging about like, and was excited that I was interested in it. And then COVID happened. I graduated 2020. So there was a lot of uncertainty with like moving forward. School is going to be all online now. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going into the College of Arts and Science first. Mm. And I did a year of general classes. And by the end of that, I still found myself wondering, like, about engineering. And it, like, it never really, it was always waiting in the back of my brain. And it was kind of like a what if. Like, what if I finished this degree in arts and science? And I just keep thinking, like, what what would have happened Mm -hmm. if I tried engineering? And I decided, you know, I'm only one year into arts and science. Like, what do I have to lose? And it went from, like, what if to why not try it? And I went in, like, I didn't have any friends going into it at this point I didn't know anybody kind of just dived head first in and at that time also didn't know anything about geological engineering or <laughs> what it was I yeah. really had no idea it was just through like meeting profs and obviously learning the concepts in first year that it started to kind of get on my radar mm. and I guess it was kind of between like chemical or civil or geological and as I thought about it more when it comes to geological engineering, it's very different in the way that rock and soil mm-hmm. is so variable. And the fact that there's no real standards that you can follow where it's like, <laughs> I want to build a house yeah. that's this size. This is the exact type of steel I need to support this load, whatever. Rock has a mind of its own. And I feel like it was something that I was not only interested in, but that could keep me engaged hmm. throughout a long career. So. Yeah, that's kind of kind of why I, I decided to go with geological. I love that. I love that story because I love it on so many ways. I love it first off of describing geological and how it's so varied and so dependent on a natural system because engineering, you think of very rigid and like you guys are all about like standards and practices and yes. <laughs> math could, being consistent across kind of multiple fields and multiple theories, right? So like that's something that's very, very funny about geological engineering. It's a little bit different than the rest of engineering. But I love that story too, that you had a beautiful mentor. And I think sometimes all that it takes is one person early on to be like, hey, did you know this existed? And I love that you took that idea to be like, okay, like, well, what if to like, why not? I think that's really 
really powerful. How did you feel when you hit that why not and you first entered engineering? Did it kind of click and you were like, oh my goodness, this is better than arts and science and like I feel more at home? What was that like? Mm -hmm. I felt like, like I distinctly remember the first time walking into my first lecture for my first class and I went in knowing like, yeah, there's, there's lots of guys in engineering. Mm -hmm. Then I walked into my first classroom. And I was like, there are a lot of guys <laughs> in engineering. And that kind of caught me off guard. I mm. like, I knew, I thought I knew what to expect, but it still was like, oh, wow. Like I am one of the few women like in these lectures. And that was like such a new experience. Whereas mm -hmm. high school, you, you don't really yeah, no, uh, you don't find yourself that. in those situations. Yeah. yeah. And I definitely felt like it also helped that this year was kind of transitioning into in-person, which was nice. I don't really enjoy online school as much. And yeah, taking my first classes, learning the content, it was challenging, but it felt like I was like making uh, tangible steps forward mm -hmm. in like my learning and you build off things. And it, it felt like more, I don't know, rewarding, I guess, yeah. for me. Like I've always enjoyed math and sciences, but but I never actually considered myself as like someone who could pursue that mm. as a career. And as I started to interact with these concepts and everything, I realized like, no, I, I like I got this it. stuff. Yeah. I'm capable of this and I'm excited. Like I'm still a little nervous, but yeah. it's turning into excitement now. So yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's like, honestly, the best type of learning you could have. Cause like, yeah, you're always going to be a little scared of it, but like yeah. that building block and getting better and better and like feeling more confident, but like, also true like the first time you step into a class and it's mostly men it's like it is a weird it's a weird feeling you don't expect yeah. it and then you're like oh oh my goodness and like it does take a little bit to kind of adjust to it mm -hmm. yeah it's like you walk in usually you can walk into a room and just not even think twice about the people who are in the room but it's kind of I guess how I would describe it I walked in and I immediately felt like I was being perceived by everybody <laughs> yes. like it's noticeable yeah. when like the girl might walk into a room versus mm -hmm. all of the guys walking in so it was kind of like oh my gosh people are like seeing me right now I'm not just another person in this room mm -hmm. but yeah it was it was very interesting experience <laughs> but still a positive one because yeah. I I've met lots of great male friends mm -hmm. in engineering and I've been lucky enough to have like good support from my peers. So yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. No, that's really good to hear. And yeah, definitely a weird experience, but I'm happy it's a positive one. I was wondering if we could dive back a little bit into your specialty, because I know we talked about how it's like, it's a natural system. It's a little bit different. People probably still listening are like, what the hell is GON? She've never actually <laughs> defined yep. it. Could you kind of walk through that specialty and then like what would be your roles and responsibility and then like mm -hmm. of geoeng is there a particular thing like do you love rock mechanics or slope st stability or like is there tunneling is there something in geoeng that you're like yep that's my thing i'm obsessed with that subfield mm -hmm. of a subfield of a subfield <laughs> yep <laughs> so much more specific yeah. exactly yeah i guess kind of like i mentioned before the way i would describe it is the fact that it is using those natural systems, natural material, and it veers off of civil in the way mm -hmm. that we really only focus on, I guess, it's not man-made. It's what we have in front of us, and it's working with what you got, basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's lots of different like sub-disciplines <laughs> or specialties within geological. You can kind of focus on more groundwater type work with hydrology, studying and understanding how water moves through soil, through rock, aquifers, which are obviously really important resources. Mm -hmm. And it's an essential science to understand groundwater in that way. Mm -hmm. And there's geotechnical, with, which kind of meshes with civil a lot more, where it's a lot more work with, so let's say you want to build uh, a structure or a building. It, obviously, it has to be supported by the ground. And that's where <laughs> geotechnical is very important. Because <laughs> if your base isn't stable, isn't mm. suited for what you're wanting to build, you're not going to get very far. See you later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah, a lot of focus into soils and rocks and their behavior under stress and everything like that. And for me personally, I am quite interested in the mining side mm. that you can take with geological engineering. There's obviously 
probably more applications to <laughs> That's this okay. Discipline. You don't have to go through all of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me think of the list in my head. Yes. So yeah, mining is kind of what I've found myself drawn to. That's where my work experience comes from. And yeah, just some colleges, actually, I think a lot of universities have a college of engineering and a discipline of mining engineering itself. Mm -hmm. Like it's completely separate. But at U of S, we have geological engineering and you can do with mining option, which okay. would be just centering your electives around mining focused classes. Oh. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of like the range of possibilities with yeah. geological engineering. Thank you. Thank you for walking through it because now no one can like message in to be like, I still have no idea. Now they know. They have like a better <laughs> foundation to it. And and that's really cool that mining is kind of your focus and and where you want to go. Is there anything in that like mining realm or anything in GeoEng that is like really mine melted you? Like anything that you've learned that you're like, oh my goodness, this changes like how I view the world or how I view my discipline in like a fundamentally different way? Anything there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess there's quite a few sides of mining as an industry that kind of surprised me. They seem like mm. common sense when you look back on it. But to <laughs> me, having no exposure to that industry, to anything like that, it did kind of make me think twice. When I first came underground and worked in uh, potash is mm. where my experience oh, comes from. So cool. Yeah, it's, you know, soft rock. So you, you obviously have to kind of consider closure and your rock's going to be shifting and compressing after you tunnel through it. And so one thing that I found so interesting is that there's a method of, uh, I guess, a pattern for mining your panels, mm -hmm. which is called like stress relief mining. Okay. And it's where you're doing about like five parallel tunnels, all spaced out. And the one, the outermost tunnels are basically designed to collapse and designed oh. to fail. So it's creating like a, a void space where the, the back, like the roof of the tunnel has caved in. And now your stress field and the behavior of your stresses is much more different. Stress can't flow through mm -hmm. open space. So it tends to kind of go up and around where these outer edges have created voids. And it almost preserves like a block of rock above your other tunnels that can sit a lot more solid. It's protected now. Smart. So it's, yeah, it's like yeah. stress relief on the sides, yeah. And then it's preserving your more long-term development in the middle. And when I came underground and they told me they designed it to fail, no, I was quite surprised <laughs> yeah. and I thought it was so cool. So yeah, that's something that really stood out to me um, oh my the first time I came underground. I've worked underground, but I've worked in um, gold. And so mm -hmm. we definitely do not design our tunnels to fail. Like that is, yeah. that's something fundamental that I would also be like, sorry, what did you just say? Like, did you mean to say that? Like, there's no way. <laughs> Have you seen that in action? Like that must be really cool or, or also very difficult to plan on like the mine management and like the mine engineering side on your guys' side. Like that must be a nightmare to design or is it pretty easy, complicated? It's, yeah. From what I understand, like just the nature of the deposit here in Saskatchewan, it's nice and flat and long. Mm. So we're just cutting just <laughs> forward, back, we're crisscrossing. <laughs> and basically they don't necessarily like cut it and then force it to fail mm. the the way they do it so that the outer ones will fail first and be taking that stress relief mm -hmm. for the other ones is they tend to cut the outermost drifts first okay. so they're the first spaces opened up taking all that load and then they cut next in and then the final one would be the very center drift so that's like the most important one we want to keep preserved for as long as possible. So yeah, they they can just cut it and just the timing with cutting, it'll kind of wow. preferentially it'll slowly fold. close. Like dominoes. Yeah. Yeah. That's... And it's not like an instantaneous failure or anything like that. It takes some time, but it definitely, you can see it just walking around. It's always roped off. Those yeah. drifts, obviously don't want people in them, no. but you can observe like the engineering at work, which is really cool to see mm -hmm. it in action. So yeah, it's, you kind of, with potash, you can kind of rinse and repeat your cutting plan. Mm. And unless you hit anomalous geology or obviously the rock, 
which you thought might have been behaving normally isn't yeah. <laughs> tends to happen with geology yes, um, sometimes. yeah yeah then adjusting as necessary obviously but yeah usually you can kind of be using that same pattern and it's effective most of the time as well oh that's beautiful that's really mm-hmm. cool thank you for kind of like going through it and and explaining it on detail because I think that's like very fascinating and I could see it as like someone who's learning engineering and who's also just discovering this field kind of in real time I could see that being like really fulfilling and kind of beautiful to see your math and your theory be like oh yeah okay I could see it now or like that works and like yeah. the rinse repeat nature is also really nice and like that mm-hmm. that's a cool foundational thing maybe this is the answer to the next one because the next one was like within your background of mine, mine engineering department. Is that the most exciting and surprising thing that you've learned? Is there others that also stick out to you that you were like, oh my goodness, this was really cool to be part of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That stress relief mining was (laughs) a shocker to me, not expecting it uh, to be designed that way. But I guess another thing, this is a bit more of a (laughs) When I came underground, I was also surprised to see it's almost like its own little city yes. underground where you have mm-hmm. like a gas station, you have places where you can blow off dust or anything from vehicles. There's a shop, mechanic shop, heavy duty uh, mechanics, and there's electrical shops, there's offices, mm-hmm. like there's almost like a self-sustaining little, yeah. little ant society <laughs> underground, which I thought was really cool. And also... And I guess in mining in general, not just potash or anything, I guess I found it really interesting learning more about Canada's like critical minerals and Mm. just the thought of what we're doing with our resources and like how important what is mined in Canada is Mm -hmm. for all over the world. And something my professors have said and people in industry have said is if it's not grown, it's It's mined. mined. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So I never... once again, kind of seems like common sense looking it back isn't, on it. It isn't, though. It isn't, you, no. When you think of how much, you know, comes from mining, it, it feels like a really, you know, essential part of our society and how we're functioning and where we want to go with what resources we need. And I find that really cool to be a part of and mm. be directly involved in, like, meeting those needs for people around the world. So that's, like, something I've I've really enjoyed as working in mine engineering and everything yeah. like that. And it's, it's been a really cool experience. I love that. I love those two answers. Cause I completely can relate to them. Cause I had yeah. the exact same thing. Like I remember one of my early geology professors put up a list of how many resources and what resources, what minerals the average person consumes in like one year. And mm-hmm. I was dumbfounded. I was like, Ex- what? Like, I had no idea that this mm-hmm. concept of if it's not grown, it's mined and how much we use. And that fundamentally changed my view of resources and their importance. And then the importance of Canadian resources and our role kind of as a natural resource hub and giant within the world. That was something that completely changed the way that I viewed the world and just seeing how many resources come from Canada and the amount, not only like the type and the difference, but the amount of resources that come from Canada. You're like, we are a natural resources hub. Like this is insane. So it is Mm kind of, it's a cool thing to be a part of it really. It, yeah, it is fulfilling in a way to be like, okay, I was, I was part of that, that grabbed something that the entire world needs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's how I feel as well. And I feel like, even in high school and like everything, I I had no idea the, like the potential that a career in mining has and stuff like that. I was never fully aware of how much mining in Canada there is and how much opportunity there is. So yeah, it was really, really eye opening. Oh, totally. I thought it was like, kind of like the dwarfs in seven, like, and um, what is it called? Is that Snow White? Snow White? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I pictured that of mining. Like that was my only kind of reference fame. Like I was mm-hmm. like, oh, like, or like Yukon and like gold panning, but I didn't really picture yes. the like <laughs> modern day and like the breadth of mining and the breadth of resources. Yeah. I love yeah. that you brought up underground because that was also something the first time I saw it, I was like blown away. I was like, what do you mean? There's like places that you can have coffee and there's like full mechanic shops. And it just seemed like Mm -hmm. some people like, you're like, oh, do these characters never leave this underground city? Like (laughs) like, it was very, it was eye opening. 
I don't know if you've ever like watched or read Lord of the Rings or if you're a big fan, but I always thought of the Mines of Moria and like all the dwarfs. And that was very like I thought that was just something very cool that it was like a full full kingdom or a full city underground yes. yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah it's pretty amazing like coming underground especially like with uh like Potash and Saskatchewan mm. you're you'll take a shaft underground there's mm-hmm. no like portal and to think everything you're seeing under here right now had to come through that same shaft that same little box that you came down and it's just like an amazing amazing thing to see all of this come together as like a cohesive unit mm-hmm. and it's like really impressive to stand underground and think of how much work has gone into, you know, creating such a, like a large footprint and getting this machinery underground. So it's really cool to see for Mm -hmm. sure. I don't know about you, but like one thing for working underground that always stood for me is it just felt like somewhere where we had no business living. Like it felt like the same thing as under underwater almost that you're like, we Mm -hmm. really shouldn't be down here. And the fact that we are, and it's safe and it's like, fully functioning thriving like underground city just seemed so marvelous that you're like oh my goodness I can't believe humans have done this and like push mm-hmm. technology to this point point." and I don't know about you but I would always think about like what did this look like I worked in a really old mine at Red Lake one of the oldest in Canada so I was like what did mm-hmm. this look like back in the day like what did did they throw just a stick of dynamite and run? Like how, how did they first build this? Like that, that was always something that stuck out. Yeah. It's amazing thinking about how like even exploration and like you found this underground, (laughs) you knew this was down here. And uh, yeah, it's, it was really like mind boggling and thinking back, like obviously mining has a huge and long history in Canada and what's kind of cool with the underground and some, some of the drifts underground and you can see in like a, a large mind map of all the development panels and everything. You can see older drifts that were cut like so long ago that are using different patterns and like mm. you can see them testing out different ways yeah. of cutting. And it's like a little snapshot of way back when, which is, was really cool to check out. Yeah. Could you kind of describe a little bit about your day to day when you would go underground? Cause you said that it was like a shaft. So you're going down an mm-hmm. elevator for those because you can have shaft, you can have ramp, you can have like an open pit mine. Those are kind of the three standard. But when you would go down mm-hmm. your your little elevator, what would be your day to day? Would you walk around? Would you have a truck? Would you go to these underground cities and go to the, like, could you kind of maybe talk about a typical day for those who still maybe don't have an idea of like, what does that actually mean? What does it smell like? Can you see anything? What's you wearing? Like, what does it actually, mm-hmm. what's the experience of underground? Yeah, so I guess in terms of like my positions uh, as a student in the mining engineering department, I would spend like for sure 50%, if not more, of my time underground and getting ready to go down. I have coveralls, a nice big onesie. Some people <laughs> like to wear pants and a shirt, but I've I've come to enjoy the coveralls. Mm. You got your boots, your hard hat, you have a cap lamp. Everyone has to have their cap lamp on. It, it can vary by mindset, but at the one I was working at, you have to have your cap lamp on at all times underground, just safety wise and everything. And you can go out, you have your backpack, you have a big water jug and yeah, take your elevator. You're going a kilometer underground and that takes around like three minutes kind of. Sometimes it goes, feels faster than other times, but yeah, you, you kind of come out into the, you know, underground and we have a parking lot very close to the shaft. So yeah, mm-hmm. I, I don't tend to walk much as the footprint can be quite large. Even driving from <laughs> yeah. the north end to the southmost end can take like an hour. A good like 40 minutes. Yeah. Depending what vehicle yeah. you're driving. Because some are governed to like 10 kilometers an hour. Yeah. And it is a tough day when you get one of those ones. <laughs> but yeah, I one of my main responsibilities underground would have been collecting data and installing instrumentation like Mm. I had mentioned earlier with soft rock with potash there is that closure and what you want once would have mined slowly begins closing Mm -hmm. until eventually after many 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 years it just kind of closes completely in on itself and that's kind of what we're measuring and one of the student responsibilities is going and taking readings of a pin in the floor a pin in the back and we're kind of Mm -hmm. measuring with our manual stations how much it's been closing and installing instrumentation 
And with how large the mines are, there is a lot of instrumentation <laughs> to keep track of. So that can keep you busy for a whole day easily, kind of just driving location to location. There's also kind of more miscellaneous tasks of you can take brine samples. You know, we don't want fresh water underground no, in the potash never. mines, <laughs> never. but you can have, you know, your like highly saline brines and no. everything, some inflows here and there. So you, we'll sample them about kind of monthly, give or take, mm -hmm. send them out to a pilot plant, get processed just to monitor what kind of brine we're actually getting in. I guess underground, yeah, most of it is kind of data collection, monitoring, mm -hmm. things like that in terms of like my student responsibilities. And on surface, I would get to help out with like cutting plans, for example. Mm -hmm. So the borers at each mining face, you know, operated by the production crews, they have their like cutting means, plans and everything yeah. for the day. So I get to help pump those out and yeah, it's kind of cool getting to see lots of different sides of the mine engineering department because there's ventilation, there's rock mechanics, everything like that. And as a student, you kind of get to pick have yeah. dip your toes into yeah, yeah, to, into all of that. And I like that you asked what it smells like because that's that's one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's it's surprising. Like you think, I don't know. When I go underground in potash, like it smells salty. Mm. I didn't think there was like a smell for salt until you go underground and it's like it's I can smell the salt mm -hmm. down here and it's very hot about like <laughs> probably 27 degrees ish mm. and then it depends on how much air you get in the drift it gets a lot hotter <laughs> yeah, so okay. yeah it's it's very very unique environment down there very salty quite dusty mm -hmm. and very very dark yeah like I said those cap lamps have them on at all times but in training, there's those. There's a moment where they'll maybe say, "Okay, everyone, stop. Mm -hmm. We're gonna, yep, mm -hmm. turn it off." And like you see the blackest black you will ever see yeah. in your entire life. I it agree. is so cool and kind of scary if you stand in the in the darkness long enough. Um, That's terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it is. Yeah. You think you know darkness until you are underground. Uh, <laughs> yep. Oh my goodness! So, agreed. Yeah, I guess that's kind of a typical little roles in my position and everything. So mm. I really enjoy the fact that I get to spend lots of time in the field because it is just such a, a cool environment to, to work in. Oh, totally. It's such a unique environment. And like that mm -hmm. for me was one of those, like that training where they're like, turn off your light. Like that always reminded me of the old times. Cause I was like, what, what did they do before lights? Like, was it just I like know. one lantern in the dark? Like, my goodness, they must've been mm -hmm. so terrified. Like it is dark, 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 dark. And I'm so happy that you appreciated the smell question because it's one of those, <laughs> that I'm like, this is probably going to be weird. <laughs> like, but like, with gold mining, the mine that I was mm -hmm. working with in Red Lake, it was Arsino Pyrite hosted. And so when Arsino Pyrite is ground, so basically when we know that we're striking gold, it smells exactly like garlic. And so if you go down and you smell garlic, people would be like, oh, we're making money today. Like we just yeah. found gold. <laughs> like, and so you'd wow. like, it was really weird. You'd walk into like a pizza oven basically, or like a, a pizza restaurant that you're like, okay, yeah. it smells super garlicky. Like- there's gold in them hills, wow. like down that way. Yeah. Like it, it was bizarre. It was a really weird mm -hmm. thing of underground. Do you have? It's good I'm, that it was. A, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. It's good that it was a nice smell, like a, a pizza <laughs> oven. I'm. Yeah, it's always. Do you imagine like a, a rotten egg smell? No. Like, oh, we're making money, but it smells really bad right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It smells like sulfur poisoning. It smells yeah. like we need to go up. Not good. <laughs> yeah. But. The salty one is something new. I've never smelt like a, a salty smell before. Like that is very mm -hmm. odd. And when you talked about your your different roles, is there one that you like better than the other? And is there like a task that you like underground? Like, for instance, one of my tasks was looking at where we're going to go in development in terms of geologic formation. And that involved us sitting with a paintball gun shooting paintballs at the like because we oh, couldn't go God. we couldn't go to the face because it's too dangerous so they were yeah. like here's a paintball gun tell us where to go and that was oh, like my, my favorite that was my favorite task of all time like do you have no something kidding. like that that you're like yep I want to be put on like data collection on drift five like level 15 like what what's your favorite task underground if you have one mm -hmm. that's a great question 
I've never thought of like ranking them as like a favorite. <laughs> I feel like definitely the one I'm most comfortable with would be like closure readings and stuff mm. like that. And I, they are like, you know, quite repetitive and it's like typical same thing every time, but I've come to appreciate them quite mm. a bit because if I'm not with like another student, for example, I'll be solo and independent underground cool. out on my own. Yeah. And That's it's awesome kind of cool getting to spend time like it's like darker it's mm-hmm. surprisingly quiet if you're not by any belt lines or anything and just kind of getting to knowing I'm independent and I'm working and mm. it's like a kind of a sense of accomplishment even though the tasks yeah. I'm doing aren't necessarily like very intense or anything I'm, I'm happy to do them and it's an opportunity for me to explore like quite literally like every corner mm-hmm. of the mine which I thought was also just a really cool experience to really get familiar underground. It's mm-hmm. quite a task orientating yourself yeah. for the first few weeks or months sometimes. Yeah. So getting to explore like every corner and see all parts of the mine and really know my way around kind of, I have a special place in my heart for closure readings. Uh-huh. They were like the first kind of one of my first tasks. And, you know, I still, I still enjoy and look forward to, to getting mm-hmm. to spend some time by myself underground so yeah I guess Aww. probably those yeah that's a good answer like that sounds mm-hmm. very beautiful like mining is not known to be quiet like it's known to be chaotic <laughs> and like to hear like equipment from so far away and to have like a lot of moving parts and like high energy so that sounds really beautiful and like also so fulfilling of like again somebody who's like learning to be like okay like I have my independence and this is my task and I have like complete control of it like I could see that being very fulfilling like that's that's wonderful I love it yeah it yeah I I enjoy it a lot and no, there's no paintball guns. Maybe I should bring that, uh, propose that next time. Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> it honestly was super fun because it was like a drive by mm-hmm. that we would like go and we'd like have our little Toyota truck and our little gun and you would just sit at the truck and like we would always <laughs> fight. Like it would be like one person on the gun, one person driving, and it would be like, I would like to be on the paintball gun yep. today. <laughs> <Yep>. Totally. <laughs> High demand for the paintball gun. <laughs> yes, exactly. To be like that yeah. is that's the crucial position. Mila, thank you for walking through Underground and like describing such a good job of it and like what it feels like and and why you like mining and your kind of love of that. I wanted to see if we could switch over to talk about JESS, which is Mm -hmm. the Geological Engineering Student Society, and you're an executive of it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could explain the organization and then maybe speak to the mission and initiative of the program because I think you guys do a lot of good and I think it's a very cool, cool thing to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at least at U of S, basically every discipline within engineering has their own student group and like Mm. group of representatives. And for for Jess, obviously for geological engineering, we kind of represent the students from all years. We encourage the inclusion of students from all years, Mm -hmm. because especially with U of S, we have a new re-engineered program for our first year. So they've kind of switched up their approach and their style of teaching and everything like that. And so my year was the first year to do the new program. And so it's kind of cool seeing the mesh of the different experiences Mm -hmm. of older students and like, especially the newer students just going through it. And we like to organize, obviously the, the initial like fundamental goal of these student societies is to like kind of organize a grad and stuff like that, (laughs) but it's evolved into so much more. And it's really an opportunity to build a, a tight support network and a mm-hmm. community. And we provide a study space for students. And we have like a lounge and everything with a couch. We have a huge table. There's a fridge, microwaves, just a space for students to be comfortable and spend time with projects, group work, solo work. And mm-hmm. lots of people spend lots of time in that <laughs> building. So having the fridge is very helpful. <laughs> yeah. And I guess as my executive position, Last year was a second year representative. Now I'm one of the co-captains for the Canadian Mining Games team. So that's kind of my executive position. Yeah, and like a treasurer of sorts for that. So I get to focus a lot on organizing that event and bringing our team from USASC out to Sudbury is where we'll be competing uh, in March. Yeah, 
So that's kind of my my main focus in Jess. But other members, we have like event planners, and we mm-hmm. we like to schedule events uh, every year where it's like inviting second year students and new students to the program to mingle with like the upper years and the profs. We call it like pool with the profs. So we go to Snooker Shack in Saskatoon Uh, and (laughs) play some pool with our profs. Yeah. And it's free for any second years to come. So we want to make it as accessible as possible Mm -hmm. and really encourage that involvement because while obviously that those technical skills you're learning in school are essential to Mm -hmm. what you'll be doing uh, afterwards, really, yeah, being able to, to build like a community and those soft skills and practice leadership and like really engage in those, you know, community involvement sides and extracurricular sides of the university experience, I found personally have been, you know, really fulfilling and Mm. rewarding, just in the sense that I'm growing my own skills, and I'm becoming more comfortable and well rounded as a future engineer. And Mm. I'm also helping and supporting my peers in the process. And it's just like a positive feedback loop. Yeah. And I feel like everyone, especially in geological, being a smaller Field. discipline compared mm-hmm. to the others, we are quite like close knit and we all know each other. We all have the same classes. And yeah, it's just kind of like a vessel for us to focus in like involving as many people as possible and, you know, uplifting and supporting those who might need it. Like for women mm-hmm. in in mining, especially, there's very few women in mining yeah. and, you know, it's an opportunity to expose people to different types of scholarships, different types of events. And it's how I really kind of dived headfirst into going to events and interacting with industry members and everything. And it just, it opened so many more doors than I thought possible. I just thought like, oh, I'll just join like, you know. It's yeah, just for fun. Like, like, it's just like, a, yeah, it's a simple thing. Yeah. And then it turns into this something way bigger. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And I like getting to participate in mining games. I never even knew about it, but just like, it's through just that it's organized and everything and you know it's might just seem like a a little student group but really if you are committing yourself to it and you kind of embrace it Mm -hmm. you just get so much more out of it than you'd ever expect so yeah Jess has been a real highlight of like university for me yeah Yeah. I absolutely love that answer and I love that call out of being like it might seem silly it might seem small but it isn't at all like Mm -hmm. I still remember like the Dawson Club I still remember like the Miller Club, I still remember every single one that I was part of. Like, you know what I mean? Like it was mm-hmm. it was a highlight. It was something that I absolutely loved, but it also did form a sense of community. And I think like you nailed it when you said like as like a woman in mining or like a gender minority or uh, any type of minority. Like this is a place that all of a sudden you have a community and you have a safe space and you get to know your peers, which is so important mm-hmm. for kind of increasing representation and making you feel more comfortable less tokenized mm-hmm. and less like alone, right? Like it gives yes. you that that support system. I was wondering if I could ask you about the mining games and a little mm-hmm. bit more about that initiative. Could you kind of explain it for people who might not know? Because it's across Canada, the games, and it's usually also a case basis, right? Is that correct? Uh, as in like where it's held and everything? Yeah, where it's held and also like the the problem sets that they give you for that year. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Mining Games is like a Canada-wide event, and it kind of brings together universities from all across Canada with a mining engineering program. So like I said before, USASC technically doesn't have mining engineering. Yeah. We're the only university who doesn't have mining engineering. (laughs) But as geological engineers and with the mining option as well, Mm -hmm. we do get that experience, and we're toe-to-toe with these mining engineering disciplines and everything and it's a chance to basically compete in mining related or mining adjacent events and like you said it's case by case it's held at different universities so different places around Canada every year it's a new organizing committee like basically locals from that area or from that university will organize it and based on sponsors so if a company wanted to sponsor Mm -hmm. mining games directly they could sponsor an event and so let's say you sponsored the ventilation event and you kind of have some liberty to change it up and do what you'd like Mm -hmm. with that event. For example, I competed in the ventilation event last year. Amazing. And me and my friend, my good friend Jade, we went into it. We kind of got thrown into it a little. We were not very (laughs) experienced in mine ventilation. (laughs) At least, you know, we knew our way around potash mining. Mm -hmm. 
so we came into it, it's like you know what as we have the fundamentals and mm. i'm confident in our googling capabilities yes that we can figure it out but this year the sponsor decided it would be a closed book exam here is your <sighs> formula sheet you have three hours good luck and me and i just remember sitting there and i looked at jade and i was like <laughs> okay, we're really in it now. <laughs> and of course it was a multi-level mine, like hard rock. It's stoping. At the time I barely knew what that oh, was. Oh no, so it's it was, so different. <laughs> yeah. That was like, I look back on it fondly as like, yeah. it felt stressful at first going into mining games. It's like, Oh, it's engineering competition. I've never done this before. High stakes. No. And while obviously it's very, it can be competitive and everything. Yeah. You get to meet people there and it really just feels like a good time and mm -hmm. not to take yourself too seriously. Yeah. And that's when you perform the best, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you're there to enjoy yourself and not put too much pressure on yourself. So it's a great opportunity for students in engineering it can be mechanical engineering, even related to a uh, mining and chemical engineering to get to practice their skills mm -hmm. and meet new people and network. And there's companies from, across Canada, yeah. even like from the States. I've met an individual who is from a company in Europe. Like it, it brings together so yeah. many, so many people, so many backgrounds, so many types of mining. And it is one of the most valuable experiences I found from, from my university career. So it's an awesome experience. And anyone who is in geological engineering or mining engineering, like it is well worth your time. And energy to participate so yeah I'll, i would recommend it to anyone in these programs oh my goodness completely like it's just so much fun too like that's the other thing mm -hmm. think of it like it's all of these people that are so passionate about it like it's a bunch of like your peers and students and like companies it's a great place to try to find a job it's a great place to network mm -hmm. it's Honestly, it's just, it's super, super fun. It's amazing. I love that you're part of it. I didn't know that you were part of it. So that's, that's been really yeah. cool. And I hope you guys do really well this year. I'm, please you. let me know how you guys do after yes. you compete. And yes, I hope it's potash. I mean, if it's in Sudbury, <laughs> I feel like it's going to be nickel. Like I feel no, like I'm, my, I'm like, hoping, but not expecting much. No, yeah. I feel like they're going to be like, there's only one type of mining. It is the deepest in Canada and it is only nickel like that. Is yes. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. You guys thought you're getting salt. Surprise. Absolutely not. No, yep. no way. I think this is fantastic. And maybe a little bit of a, a step back from the mm -hmm. mining games and mining competition is talking a little bit. It's still, it's still related of, of talking about women and mining and the mining experience and like kind of women in engineering. And I was wondering if you could speak to that about being a gender minority within engineering, any misconceptions that you had going in and being like, okay, this is what it means to be a woman in engineering and anything that's helped you overcome those misconceptions. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. I guess I, I kind of mentioned it before, like I've never, I've been lucky enough to, you know, have support from my peers mm -hmm. and not experience, like have outright negative yeah. interactions. Yes. Just in terms of like being a woman in engineering, mm -hmm. I definitely think it's that unique experience. There's like nuance to it. Mm -hmm. And while there's no like outright negative experiences, there is like, you know, things I kind of expected, things I didn't expect being a woman in engineering. I guess for me personally, I growing up never really got to know like more hands-on like trades type things mm -hmm. or like around the house like Tools. projects or working yeah. on like vehicles or anything mm -hmm. like that. Like I never really was exposed to that much. Whereas a lot of, I found, I was kind of surprised by the sheer amount I, for what people would consider common sense for a lot of the yeah. my male peers, mm -hmm. like those, you know, household things like, yeah building things just those types of hands-on things where they did trade classes like welding and mm -hmm. building and all that kind of stuff in high school I realized what they thought kind of was common knowledge is like I have, have no very idea. little experience yeah, yeah. and I, I felt like almost like very naive and like oh my gosh I'm already like there's a discrepancy in like yeah. just my understanding or whatever behind and, or something yeah. yeah and so I feel like at times it can feel like you're almost being questioned or like mm -hmm. people might not seek you out for answers or anything like that. That's kind of how I felt at the start. I felt like I was almost like a little imposter mm -hmm. in engineering just because I didn't have that, that past knowledge. But I find 
that may be a common experience for many, many women going into engineering, where just with how you may have grown up, you might never have been considered as like, while your brothers may have gone and like, helped out with like, working on a vehicle or like, Mm -hmm. you know, participating, like, doing some household, exactly, stuff like that, like, you may not have been considered or given the opportunity to participate. Mm -hmm. And then moving forward into a technical field, it, it kind of hit me like, how different backgrounds we come from in terms of like being exposed to this kind of stuff. And, you know, that's been resolved and like I've worked and felt much more comfortable in my capabilities as I continue to take classes and take courses. I've realized it's not about like being naturally good at this or understanding it right off the bat. It's like you prove you can learn it. And that's what I've been proving is like, I can learn this and I'm adaptable and everything like that. And, you know, as you go through these classes, you build better relationships with Mm -hmm. like a lot of my guy friends in engineering, I've built a lot better relationships with where we're collaborators and it feels like very equal and we're Mm -hmm. on like equal experience and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really nice to be able to have that because in first year I felt so overwhelmed and I didn't know anybody and I kind of felt like an odd man out in like lab groups or anything like Mm -hmm. that. And it held me back from like kind of speaking my ideas and things like that. Cause mm. I thought like, well, yeah, who am I to have a good idea when I like, I don't, I'm still learning. I just stuff. don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an yeah, internalized so that, misconception yes. of yourself. Yeah. Yes. So that's something that I've definitely, I feel like I'm not overcome it fully. There's still moments where I still do feel this way, but I have faith in myself and the process and I don't second guess myself as often which which has that's good been a, a something like I'm proud of and mm-hmm. continuously improving on and I guess one thing I have also noticed just being a woman in engineering obviously there's less women and there's mm-hmm. more scholarships for women and like kind of scholarship opportunities mm-hmm. and especially for mining uh women yeah. in mining like it's a it's a huge like initiative to have those scholarships and things like that to recognize women going into this field and studying this and I've been a recipient of a few of these scholarships targeted like meant for thank you <laughs> meant for women in engineering or women in mining and sometimes I, it has felt like you know the little comments of like oh you know like you guys just like oh, the negative sign side up for of engineering it. and yeah. you get money mm-hmm. and like oh you just gotta mm-hmm. show up and you're getting paid to do it you're like absolutely like not yeah no yeah <laughs> and it's like it's I've thought about it a lot over this past year and like how I feel about it and I guess because it always kind of irks me I'm just like Mm -hmm. I I never was able to like understand or vocalize why I felt this way obviously it's it's like putting into question my uh not eligibility but like your ability uh, your tech yeah that is well and like being exactly and like being a a, like viable recipient of this yeah exactly like a candidate and it kind of reduces me to just one thing like I am just a woman mm-hmm. in engineering that is what I am just woman here studying this thing that's like what it felt like yeah and I'm like the reason I, I found that like I've realized the reason it, it did bug me and like made me upset is because it's it's redu- you know reducing me to one thing like one like just flat identity of mm-hmm. I am a woman here studying engineering and it's mm-hmm. just like disregarding the fact that I'm a complex person and I have like so many different sides to myself other than just being a woman in engineering is like, I'm kind and I like to Mm -hmm. have fun and I'm really engaged in what I do and I'm passionate about what I do and I work hard and I'm getting recognized for some hard work and for being a woman in engineering. It is a part of me and a part of my identity that I'm proud of, but it it is not the the only thing. The sole thing that this is Mila, this is who you are. No, it's dehumanizing. Really, like yeah. it, it tokenizes you completely to like a census data point other than like a true person. Yeah, it just, it, it makes you feel like you're just meeting like a number, like a tick, tick, got the woman in, yeah. in mining or woman in engineering and everything like that. And like, while people may say it as like a teasing joke or something like that, it still, it still implies like how they feel about it. And mm-hmm. it, it, it feels like it is kind of like, oh, this is kind of unfair. Like, of course. Mm-hmm getting another scholarship or of course there's especially in engineering you can filter scholarships and just say woman and like a lot come up but if you do like 
there's no man in engineering scholarships. And I feel like I've kind of had this discussion with my peers of like, there are so many, but there's like none for men, but it's we need, we need scholarships like this. Yeah, exactly. And there's such a discrepancy and, you know, how are we really going to attract and retain females in, in STEM and in engineering, if we're not showing like there is support for mm-hmm. women in engineering, there's a desire and it like, it's encouraging you to enter this field and there is rewards and opportunities to be had for women in engineering and, and STEM fields, because obviously in the past, that wasn't the case. No, we were banned. And we weren't even allowed exactly. to become engineers until like, I, I think know. like the late seventies, I think like that's when it like actually opened up to women in engineering. Mm-hmm. I think Women weren't yeah. allowed in mining until the mid seventies. Yeah. I was gonna say it was in the seventies that yeah. it was up until then illegal for women to even set foot mm-hmm. underground. And like I actually met uh, a gentleman this year where he was I can't remember how he stumbled upon this topic of conversation, but we were talking about just mining and in general and being a woman in mining and he mentioned how when he first started working, he he met some of the first like women who were allowed underground oh my and like goodness. talking to him and like it really puts into perspective how recent this was and like mm-hmm. I, it's not like so far in the past that we can just assume we're all we're all we're good women can are legally allowed to go underground so we're good like no more yeah. work is to be had it's like no we can't stop here Mm-mm. you know we, we want our engineers make lots of you know like design decisions and like they're highly involved in like lots of I don't know like decisions that can impact society and and things like that and Mm -hmm. we want it to be representative of the society society. they're working for Mm -hmm. exactly and and while it may seem like oh all you have to do is be a woman in engineering to get a scholarship it's like we need women (laughs) in engineering and without the like kind of financial support or the outward like showing like we want women in engineering it's encouraged and Mm -hmm. like some of my male peers may never have questioned like of course I'll go into engineering they were told since they were kids probably that they were good at math and science to be like well you will be an engineer and like a girl shows that they're good at math and science and they're like well that's a nice cute little quirk like good job I know keep going (laughs) it's not this it's not said the same of being like okay well she's also going to be an engineer like an engineer stereotypically like I think that those scholarships don't exist because they're the baseline. They can apply to every mm-hmm. single other scholarship and every single other opportunity is already there for them to become mm-hmm. an engineer. Whereas ours are far more specialized. And like you said, they didn't exist until the seventies and those scholarships yeah. didn't exist then. It was still just like becoming legal that we could go underground. Like yep. that's a professor. I've had a professor who was one of the first women in mining she told me that when she first started her degree, in order to keep the rest of the class engaged, they would do two slides, a slide of Playboy, two more slides, a slide of Playboy. That is one generation removed from me and maybe two generations mm-hmm. removed from you. Like that is a very close, mm-hmm. close in our history of women in engineering within Canada. Like it's, we do need this financial motivation and we do need these scholarships and this, I think you said it right to be like, you have to put your money where your mouth is. And I think organizations Mm -hmm. need to be like, yep, we're willing to stand by this and this is how we've done it. But I also want to talk on one thing quick before I'll, I'll send it back because you've been dropping nothing but fantastic, (laughs) (laughs) fantastic truths of this. I think Mm -hmm. one thing that stood out in your answer is when you talked about Maybe your male peers, it's a joke, but it kind of represents how they feel about it, of Mm -hmm. it being unfair. And I agree with you. I think that is probably the undercurrent of their belief of like, oh, it's unfair and you've done nothing to deserve it. Mm -hmm. Mila, how many things have you already done at your age and your position of students? Like you're talking about like, yeah, I'm co-chiefing like for like the mining games and I'm also doing like podcasts and I'm also going underground and like I've had all of these years of experience. Like you deserve those scholarships and spades. Anyone who's listening to this interview within five minutes can be like, oh my goodness, she's worked her ass off and she is so passionate about this field. Like no one becomes to be like, hey, yeah, me and Jade were so into ventilation that we're going to take a three hour her exam and just sit here and do this competition you have to be so involved in it and so passionate about it and like you deserve to have that recognition of that hard work and like it wasn't by accident it wasn't because of your gender and 
I guess I have one more thing to say is I always, <laughs> I always um, sometimes hate asking the question about like women in science or women in engineering because I think it can fall flat or can fall into the trap of being tokenizing and that's the most important thing about you is your gender, but it isn't. It is. It isn't mm-hmm. at all. Like it. It's you're you're a true person, and sometimes when they think of it of of just a token or a, a dehumanizing census data point, it it drives me crazy. I mm-hmm. feel the same wrath whenever anyone yes. does it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's like I find my like the relationships I've built with like fellow women mm. studying engineering and everything like that. It's it's really been so valuable and I, I appreciate those like friendships so much mm. because it it really is like a shared experience and at times where you may feel like isolated and kind of the odd man out in a lot of situations like having them knowing yeah. they're kind of you know you're all in it together yeah and it it really does make a difference and yeah I, I cherish my relationships with like these women and I look up to up to so many of them and it, it really is what helps keep pushing me to mm-hmm. to keep improving and keep being like that best version, like put that best foot forward in, in everything I do is mm-hmm. because like I see other women that I respect and yeah. I appreciate like working so hard and it's like, damn, I, I want to be that person too. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Like there's a space for me here and, and everything like that. And I really appreciate your kind words. Like like thank you very it's much. True. <laughs> it's, yes, and, it's, it's true. Yes. It's true. Yeah. It's sometimes it's like I, I kind of battle with like it's hard to feel proud of myself sometimes because it's like there is that nagging thought of like like is some of this just like attributed to yeah. that fact that I am that like underrepresented group of women in engineering. But when I take a step back and look at that big picture, is like it as you said, it's mm-hmm. just that small part part of myself and it's an important part of myself, but if that's the only focus and it's disregarding all these other pieces of me it it does become negative and Mm -hmm. it's upsetting to be reduced to just just one thing so yeah no I'm happy that you have that community and the words were true that like they were a hundred percent they're a hundred percent true but like I'm happy you have that community because I agree sometimes it can feel I mean you know it's they're saying it as like a joke and like you're trying to to forget it you know that it's bullshit you know that you're like nope it's not real I deserve my place but it does sometimes Mm -hmm. infiltrate into your brain and on maybe like a harder day you do start to have those questions and Mm -hmm. those kind of that feeling for it I remember I kind of went through something similar that I had people say something about a scholarship that I received and Some days I would be so excited and I'd be like, oh, I got a scholarship and I'd be so proud of myself. And other days Mm -hmm. I would have existential dread to be like, oh my goodness, did I deserve that scholarship? Or is it just because there was only three of us? Like what? But I think you kind of can't focus on it. You have to just focus on the positive and also focus on like your peers and the group of women that are with you and and people like Jade and people like in your life that are like also working their ass off and and doing so well. Mm -hmm. Mila, we're... We're basically at time, but I want to ask one more question if I could. Just of to course. end it on a, um exciting kind of point or something that mm-hmm. – what's on your radar? as? And this could be anything. Mm-hmm. It could be within Jess. It could be within school. It could be within geoeng and mining, or it could be within engineering at large. But, like, is there something that you're currently geeking out about that you're mm-hmm. like, oh, my goodness, this is going to be the future of it? You're like, ventilation – I'm obsessed. Like, what is it? What's the thing that you're excited about? Okay. Uh, <laughs> great question. I guess, obviously, like I mentioned, like mining games is a, a big focus right now. Time's mm-hmm. going to fly by. And before I know it, we're going <laughs> to be on the on the plane to Toronto. And then a five-hour bus ride to Sudbury. <laughs> oh, goodness. Really fun. Gross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was surprisingly difficult to get to Sudbury, Ontario. Yes, it is. I it's had no mess. idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And we have a great team this year, so I'm I'm really looking forward to it. And we all have like pre-existing connections and relationships with each other. Mm-hmm. Whereas last year, there was definitely like kind of meeting for the meeting some people for the first time, and we definitely became good friends like over those three days. But I'm I'm really excited to see where it goes with like a group of people I already know and have worked with and everything mm-hmm. like that. So yeah, that's a a big priority right now. And I guess school has just been busy 
finals are coming up. Oh. So yeah, and keeping busy with Jess, we're doing kind of fundraising events right now. We have planned uh, a mine tour actually. Oh, fun! At one of the nutrient sites to cool. kind of give an opportunity for the the younger years, like second year and everything, to get exposed to the mining industry and give them that opportunity. So I'm excited for that as well. And I guess a little little personal thing on my radar mm-hmm. is me and two of my like bestest friends. We've been doing races over the oh. summer. Like we started with a 10k. We did a half marathon this last summer and we're we're set and planning to do another half marathon oh, amazing. yeah um i kind of like to mm. always make sure i have you know kind of goals and priorities and like Different not just aspects. school it's yes exactly mm-hmm. yeah so that's mm-hmm. definitely one a personal goal of mine right now it, oh. it's so easy to get sucked into just school school school, school. <laughs> yeah. yes so yeah. gotta gotta think about just hobbies and enjoy myself so yeah keeping busy mm. but really excited for the next few months. Oh, I love that answer. That's such a good balanced answer and such a good way to end it of being like, yeah, you know what? School's important. We're going to kick ass at mining games. And like, we're really excited and like, Uh we're dreading the bus, but we're excited to have our team to to go for it. But I love that balance of bringing it back to be like, yep, it's all about friends and community and, and having hobbies and stuff. Mila, Thank you so much for this interview. It was so lovely to sit down and chat with you. I loved learning more about mining games and kind of your experience. And again, diving back into mining, it's been a little bit for me, but it was like on a personal note, I was like, oh, this is so much fun to get to talk about it again. I was like, oh, I love it. So thank you so much for coming on the show. It was, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was really, truly a pleasure. And I agree. I like it's it's not as often I get to kind of geek out about stuff like this. The smell of underground is something I don't get to talk about often. So thank you for giving me that opportunity to tell the world. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's been it's been really fun. And I, I'm honored to be included among all the wonderful guests you've had on your podcast. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. The honor is ours. And thank you so much for also like hedging that question like a champion. When it like left my mouth, I was like, that was so weird. But I was like, no, but it's it's what I remember of underground is like the smell of gold and the smell of, mm-hmm. of garlic. So thank you for being very thank kind, very, very kind person. Mm-hmm. Um, of course. <laughs> And for those listening, thank you very much for doing so. This was the Smoko Podcast. We will see you next week with a new guest. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye for now.